All right. Welcome to the Provotnik School of Government. Uh, I'm Pepper Culpepper. I'm Vice Dean of the School, and I'm a professor of government and public policy here. Uh, we are thrilled tonight to be able to welcome Ben Ansel uh, to discuss his new book, along with John Simpson. The book is Why Politics Fails. Um, and its subtitle is what we really want to talk about tonight, uh, Five Traps of the Modern World and How to Escape Them. Um, that should especially engage us here at the School of Government. So before we dive into that discussion, in which I expect you all to be a part, um, it's not just the three of us. Uh, we want to, these are big problems, they're collective problems, and we, the collectivity, are going to talk about them. Uh, let me briefly introduce uh, our guest. Ben Ansel, to my right, is Professor of Comparative Democratic Institutions at Nuffield College at, at Oxford. Following a PhD at Harvard, he taught at the University of Minnesota for several years before becoming a professor at Oxford. At the young age uh, of 35, he's made Fellow of the British Academy in 2018. His work has been widely covered in the media, including the World Bank's World Development Report, the New York Times, and The Economist. He is the principal investigator of the multi-million pound ERC project, The Politics of Wealth Inequality. He is co-editor of the most cited journal in comparative politics, comparative political studies, and he's written three award-winning academic books. Um, over the last several decades, when politics has failed in a big way, the man to my left, John Simpson, has been there to cover it, right? John is the BBC's World Affairs Editor, and he's an award-winning veteran news broadcaster who's covered almost every major event of the world from the 1960s to the present day. His reports on the big moments of recent history include the Iranian Revolution, the First and Second Gulf Wars, the fall of the Soviet Union, the Berlin Wall, the end of apartheid in South Africa, the genocide in Rwanda, the wars in the former Yugoslavia and the Tiananmen Square massacre in Beijing. Uh, John has seen politics fail and he's seen it succeed. Uh, he's an eyewitness of the many wars in the Middle East and Afghanistan, the Irish troubles and the South African and Rhodesian struggles, as well as in Eastern Europe uh, and in Latin America. John has reported from 140 countries and interviewed 200 world leaders and dictators, met successive heads, met, ranging from Mikhail Gorbachev and Vladimir Putin to Saddam Hussein. He's met successive heads of the IRA, Hezbollah, Hamas, the Taliban and the Medellin and Cali drug cartels at the height of their power. So he'll find Ben Ansel from Nuffield College no problem to handle, we hope. <laughs> we are so delighted to have Ben and John here to discuss the book tonight, and I'll chip in um, from time to time. Uh, ben, why don't you tell us what the principal argument of the book is? Thank you, Pepper. Um, and thank you to Pepper and to Nairi for hosting me here and for John for being here. This is um, it's, it's quite overawing, but I will try not to be too overawed. Thank you also, all of you, for attending here or or online. Okay, so um, Pepper asked me not to filibuster. If you want to know about the filibuster, that's in the introductory chapter of the book. There's a discussion of that. Uh, what I will do instead is I will um, try and give you an overview of the book. Um, and if you read a book with the title, Why Politics Fails, uh, you won't be surprised to hear that the first question you get from everybody is, so why does politics fail? Uh, you know, and so sometimes I want to shake my fist at my editors for that particular suggestion. <laughs> but um, let me um, answer that to the best uh, I can in a, in a brief period of time by saying there's, there's a simple answer and there's a more indirect answer. So, so the simple answer, um, the main theme of the book and the theme of the five traps in the book um, is that it's hard for us to achieve collective goals that we broadly agree on. And the collective goals in the book set up each part of the book. So they're democracy, equality, solidarity, security, and prosperity. It's hard to achieve those goals because we get in the way, or rather our self-interest gets in the way. And that's something that scholars of political economy will know a great deal about, what we call collective action problems. Um, but the reason that happens is because politics is different from other domains of social science. All of us, whenever we're placed in a kind of strategic situation, which is most of the time in politics, um, have, have incentives to misrepresent what we want, or to misbehave in some kind of way, to slack off. I'm sure none of you have slacked off, but imagine a world in which you might not be observed and you could slack off, or cheat, or renege on some kind of deal. Um, those incentives undermine our ability to get towards collective goals. You know, one obvious example is we would all like to avoid paying our taxes, uh, and we'd be quite happy as long as other people pay taxes to, to receive the public services the tax is paid for. And the reason, of course, that we pay our taxes is because there is a legal system uh, and a criminal justice system that can enforce that on us. But many political issues lack third party enforcement. And that's the really crucial problem to politics is that there isn't anything behind a lot of our politics that can enforce agreements or promises that we might want to make to one another. And that means 
any political player is going to have an incentive to renege in some way, and no one can necessarily punish them for it. So let me give you a couple of examples from politics. Whenever you read a manifesto from a political party, you might think, well, that's great. I'd love to vote for that party and get free broadband. And then when you vote for the party and they get in and they don't give you free broadband, there's nothing you can do about it. It's not like you'd signed a deal with Virgin Mobile to get broadband for a certain price and that you could sue. If they don't come through the free broadband, tough. There's no judge or jury that you can go to. And that's true also for political parties. If you're a party that's part of a coalition and one of your coalition partners decides to leave and tank the government, right, so a kind of basic rule of Belgian or Israeli or Dutch politics, there's nothing you can do about it. You can't go to the Belgian king and say, well, that's not on. There's no third party that can enforce it. And this is also true in the most important domain of all, in international warfare. Even NATO allies, they trust one another, but they cannot be 100% sure that they will be backed if invaded, because if they were and NATO didn't stand up for them, who would they call on, right? Again, there's no judge or jury or executioner, I guess, in this case, that can enforce that. That's, these are basic political problems. And that's why political science and political economy are hard, right? So economists like to talk about the difficulty of economic decisions because resources are scarce. I'd argue that politics is even harder because the scarcity that we have is trust in one another which is a really difficult thing to, to create with one another. We have to make each other promises all the time, but we can't ever be sure they'll be enforced. So how do you get to solutions from that in the book? The argument I make is, is that all promises we make to each other are contingent. They're just words that we say to one another. We can't necessarily enforce them, but what we can do is we can design institutions and protect those institutions, even when they don't necessarily seem to be functional that allow us to sort of align our preferences and write them down over the long run. You can think of institutions that are around us like fossils. Um, they make most sense at the time they're created, but they live a long time afterwards and they guide our behavior. And we've seen with the prorogation of parliament in recent years that overriding institutions can have unexpected effects. And the other thing we can use are social norms. Right? We can punish one another uh, if we transgress. A social norm is just that. You can't enforce it with a judge, right? If somebody doesn't shake your hand, because you're Jose Mourinho or something at the end of a football match, you can't enforce that behavior, even though it would be nice if everybody greeted one another. And so in the book, I talk about the ways that social norms can resolve problems like the traffic in, in Bogota, Colombia, where the mayor, uh, Antonis Marcos, had mimes stand to sort of pretend to be hit when cars were driving too fast. Uh, those kinds of norms can, can work, but clearly the mime could not in fact arrest somebody. They could mime arresting somebody. That's a very different thing. Um, the other reason why politics fails, the kind of second answer that's in the conclusion, is politics fails if we don't take that fundamental problem of uncertainty in making these uncertain promises, if we don't take that seriously. If we think that we can get rid of politics or squeeze it out by replacing it in some fashion with technology, right? So think about cryptocurrency and the blockchain as different ways of trying to use technology to replace the complicated political and legal institutions we have managing money and managing contracts. We can't replace politics with markets alone, and we certainly can't replace politics with an appeal to strong leadership that can somehow overcome our differences. Like ultimately, we all do disagree, we might all misbehave and we might misrepresent what we do. And, and that's just who we are. So in some ways, the book is a bit of political therapy. It's asking us to, like a good therapist might do, asking us to look in ourselves and see that the behaviours that we don't like in the political system are also behaviours that we engage into, to understand that better. So let me conclude by talking about how the book is set up. And I'll do this really, really briefly. So the book has five different sections, five things we might all agree on. I hope. Democracy, equality, solidarity, security, and prosperity. And in each of those sections, when you, you know, when you all buy the book and recommend it to your friends, you'll be describing it as why do, why do we want democracy or equality? What is the trap? What is the collective action problem that we get into where our individual interests undermine what we want? And then what kind of solutions are there? Because I am in the Blavatnik School and I'm contractually obliged to mention that to get out of those problems. Okay. And so in democracy, the trap, for example, is there's no such thing as a will of the people, uh, unless we all agree. And I give an example in the book of what happens when you insist everybody agrees. That was the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth of the 16th to 18th century called the Siem. And 
in that, thank you, John, <laughs> it was a disaster, in that parliament, everybody, every legislator had the right to bring any debate to an end by exercising what was called the liberum veto, which means I freely oppose. Once you did that, you could end any session. And indeed, many years went by in the middle of the 18th century where there, were no, where there was no legislation at all. And somebody would stick their hand up. And now Poland, as, as you will probably know, didn't exist for a number of centuries. And the reason it didn't exist for a number of centuries is it had hostile powers either side, Prussia and Russia. And those hostile powers, knowing how the liberum veto worked, bribed Polish legislators to freely oppose, bringing down any legislation up to the point where the last piece of legislation that was signed in the Shem was the second partition of Poland. In other words, the liberum veto had destroyed the country itself. So it's those types of traps I talk about in the book. And then I'll talk about solutions in the book, such as citizens' assemblies, um, compulsory voting, um, proportional representation, and ways that we can implement political institutions that might resolve some of these types of problems. But I'll stop there because I know I'm reaching my allotted time. Thanks, Ben. So you've given us something, something to chew on already. And I want to pick up right there because on the one hand, Ben gives you a, a set of solutions to democracy, which are institutional fixes, citizens assemblies. Citizens assemblies bring together people. Um, they're often, they, they, they attempt to be representative of the population, representative of the population. They pull people together to deliberate um, and then to come to a solution that might not be what we come up with um, in competitive politics where everything sort of falls prey to polarization. So on the one hand, you've got that solution. On the other hand, uh, and what I take to be the thrust of the conclusion, um, it's really all about uh, norms and having the right norms. So uh, in this country, in the United States where I'm from, um, we feel like the, these norms have been de degraded uh, fairly rapidly over the past few years. Um, are the fixes institution or are they about bringing together a different way of interacting? And then how do we get there? Yeah, it's very hard to create a social norm through a, through a policy. It's quite easy to design a new institution. British governments love doing that because, because of our scorched earth electoral system. When you come into power, you can just get rid of all the previous institutions and replace them with new ones, perhaps not the institutions of parliament itself, although the last few years, you know, we've, we've even seen that as well. Creating norms is, is very hard. And, and, you know, I allude in the book to what, you know, John F. Kennedy makes his, you know, ask not what your country can do for you speech. That's sort of norm creation. But it's not clear that what happened through the rest of the 60s <laughs> um, could be viewed as, you know, a giant kind of collective agreement in American society. It looks more like the beginning of polarization there. Let me come quickly to citizens' assemblies. So, you know, I meant the example I gave you from democracy was what happens if you try and make everybody agree when well, well, nothing gets done. So if we do disagree on things, then the trade-off that I bring up in the book is between chaos, where we all disagree on things in, in such disparate ways that there is no collective agreement we can come to at all. And the classic example of that that you've all lived through uh, is Brexit in 2019, when it was impossible for Parliament to decide uh, what it wanted to do, and it just kept spiraling around between options. Or you have a simpler set of options where people just disagree on, along a single dimension, and then you end up with polarization. And that, of course, is where we ended up in December 2019, when Boris Johnson kind of simplified the question again and split the country down the middle and got the bigger half. Citizens' assemblies do something nice. They take complicated questions, but they force everybody into a room to see if they can take that complexity and find a kind of single dimension of debate. So in other words, to discover where they agree, where they still disagree, um, but that many things that seem different have something more in common. So the Irish did this with abortion. It's obviously the most polarizing of all issues. And clearly some people are completely anti-abortion and other people are sort of no limitations at all. But most policies in the, in the world end up somewhere in the middle and then there are things to trade off. Right? Uh, the life, uh, the sort of health uh, of the mother, uh, cases of rape and incest, how late should abortions be? And the Irish asked their citizens to sit in rooms and discuss this, and they ended up with a pretty moderate answer at the end of the citizens' assemblies that looked remarkably like the policy that was implemented that legalized abortion in Ireland. And here's the really neat thing. Some Irish political scientists looked at the at text data, at how Irish citizens had spoken in citizens' assemblies, and they looked at the complexity and the degree of negative or grandstanding statement, and they compared that to the parliamentary committees that made the decision afterwards. And citizens spoke in more complex, more conciliatory language than parliament did, right? So they'd done a better job themselves. And it gives a sense, I think, of how 
an institution like that can inculcate a norm. Fair enough. John, you've seen a lot uh, over time of uh, uh, politics breaking down and, and, and politics hopefully launching uh, more hopefully. Um, where have you seen norms built successfully or have you seen that? Is this, is this a, a chimera that we're not likely to see? Well, uh, let me just first of all say I've, I've just finished reading Ben's book. I had to read it fast because uh, I've, you know, um, always um, short of time for, for everything. Um, I'm going back to read it a second time. Absolutely lovely read. I mean, really, really interesting. And the range of examples, I think the only thing uh, you didn't refer to really was Inuit uh, uh, responses to snow, but everything else, uh, fascinating. I really, really recommend it. Um, there's always a danger, of course, that one says that the system that one knows oneself from having grown up into it is, is the natural, sensible, uh, normal state for humans to be in. That's to say, is it? Not if you live in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but if you live in a country which is which works properly, you do tend to assume that the system which uh, created the, the 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 normality you see around you is the best one possible. And I, I've got loads of friends in China who are um, absolutely convinced that the best system is to leave the difficult uh, political decisions to, to, to the government and simply make, make money and enjoy yourself as best you can. Um, I can't tell you, I mean, I'm, I'm now 78. I've, I've, I've lived through uh, a lot of changes, not only in other countries, but also in this country. I can't tell you what, a, what revolutionary times we're living in in this country. If I had said uh, to, I don't know, to my father, perhaps in, in 1980, it won't be terribly long, uh, 42, 42 years, before we have uh, a, a, a black chancellor of the exchequer, uh, Indians in, in the key uh, roles of government and a woman prime minister he could have accepted the woman prime minister because in 1980 actually we had we had a woman prime minister the first one in this country but that would have seemed and earlier in 1940 that would have seemed like some kind of wild revolution impossible to conceive of but so normal has it seemed that when it happened, we, 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 we was almost unremarked, not, a, not necessarily in other countries, like, I, you know, the Indian press in particular, but also the South African press and, and uh, I, I think the Nigerian press picked up on it, on it hugely. But in this country, it just seemed, OK, fine, that was the Liz Truss government, which lasted for a minute and a half and wasn't exactly, you could say, the, uh, the best example of good, of good politics. But nevertheless, extraordinary thing and unremarkable, another unremarkable thing, uh, another remarkable unremarked thing. Um, as I, I was just killing times, I came here, I went into Blackwell's, um, no staff anywhere, nobody at the tills, nobody anywhere and nobody around and i think that 50 100 years ago people would have grabbed the books and and walked out with them instead there was a little uh, polite queue where the person at the till ought to have been but was off on a tea break or toilet break or, or something like that but it were they were waiting. They didn't walk out. There's none of those electronic things at the doors uh, to stop you. Why don't they do that? Well, because society has come to a different, a different phase. I mean, there are societies in the world where I, I saw this in Iraq, um, 
when uh, the uh, American invasion happened, American and British invasion, I should say, um, happened, that everything collapsed and people attacked the government ministries in, in large numbers, taking away absolutely everything, stripping the buildings to the concrete floors and walls, taking away cladding from the walls. Why did they? I said to some man who's got a whole armful of clad, why are you bringing, taking cladding? Whatever use is that to you? And he said, well, by the time I got there, there wasn't anything better to take. So this is not a human response, but it is a, um, a way in which we come to accept the the, the the norms of society and act with some kind of 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 of, of civility and I you know I, I I felt again and again as I as I read your book I was seeing different different examples all the time the one thing that I did think might have been good unless I skipped over it my favorite society uh, the one which I think has achieved most and done the best and is a lovely place to live uh, is now, um, you know, in some danger. It's Taiwan, which, uh, and uh, you know, after the after the Second World War, after the communist takeover in 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 uh, China, was um, really quite a rough place, run by the 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 the, the Kuomintang under really ferocious systems. And has managed to evolve into a really lovely, livable society. So I think it comes from here, doesn't it? It doesn't. It's not imposed on you. That doesn't seem to work. What What do you think? Yeah. So th it's reminding me that the most popular shows on TV, or the most popular recent shows, are about um, some form of post-apocalyptic situation, right? So The Last of Us or The Walking Dead, zombies happen or something happens that removes all of the norms that we've got used to. So I begin the security chapter or part of the security chapter talking about how I wake up every single day safe in my bed, go downstairs, get in my car that's still there, even though I never lock my car, please don't go and steal my car. <laughs> you know, I drive in drugs so that nothing happens on the way, right? No one throws a brick at my car. And I never think about this. And now North Oxford is a bubble. Okay? But most of us in the United Kingdom live in that bubble. And that bubble is novel. And in historical terms, um, we use it in science fiction to show what happens if you remove the bubble. But that bubble doesn't exist everywhere in the world. And it certainly doesn't exist in many of the places that John has visited. The other thing that, that this conversation reminded me of is sometimes people's norms and understanding of other people's norms present quite an interesting image of how uh, different societies view one another. Let me give you the, the concrete example here. So I talk in the book about China's social credit system that many of you will be aware of, this idea that by um, collectively good behavior, you get sort of, um, you get points. Um, it's not clear what those points add up to. Someone described it to me as collect all these points and get a free umbrella. Uh, but the important thing is if you do bad things, right, if you cheat in some way, then you get blacklisted. And in fact, you can be banned from flights and so on. So the Chinese have this early social credit system. To be honest, it's quite ramshackle. It mostly exists in localities. It's not really wired up together. But there's a uh, anthropologist at UCL who went to interview um, Chinese citizens about what they thought about the social credit system. And a number of them said, well, you have this, you have this, what, what are you talking about? You've had this for years. You have credit scores. Um, you know, every time you guys, you know, don't pay for a train fare, that goes on, on your credit score and your government knows about it. So the idea that we think of with credit scores, which is you know, a very painful way in which the financial industry marks us about giving further loans, has sort of become this, this view of some Chinese citizens about, oh, well, you have your type of credit system too. And in a way, they're right, right? And some of the decisions we make are scored like that. But in a way, it's a complete misunderstanding of the types of norms that now govern living under the CCP compared to the norms that govern us under a democratic society. Let me bring in a, a question which has come in from online about um, what's really a democracy been. Um, good evening to our panel members. This is from uh, Nashiru A. Um, can we say a country is democratic when less than one fifth of its population votes to bring a political party to power or form a government? Um, what is the difference between a quote unquote democratic country where less than one fifth of the electric select the government and that of a country where about 40% of the population supports a government based on traditional culture, religion, or color? 
Um, well, I am the professor of comparative democratic institutions, so I better have an answer, I suppose, to that type of question. Uh, and, and the answer that we give in every democratization lecture, including the ones I used to give at Blavatnik, is, oh boy, is that complicated. Um, <laughs> which is, it depends on whether you want a kind of cut and dry, formal definition of democracy, whether you either is or you ain't democratic. Um, and those types of systems that the, the famous economist Joseph Schumpeter came up with the, the idea of, essentially all they require is alternation in power. And that, that alternation in power come from free and fair elections so that you can lose power. And so governments have to be elected, able to do things, and the elections have to be free and fair. Beyond that, it doesn't really matter. So if the way that you can be elected is have 20% of people vote in a way that makes you the largest party and the system lets you in and you can be turfed out, then you're a democracy under that rule. And I think that frustrates a lot of people because that doesn't seem very democratic. It's basically, can you throw the bums out? And that's, you know, it's not, a, I mean, that feels like a not hugely aspirational goal for us to have, but it's still an important one uh, because in many countries you can't throw the bum out as, you know, as we saw when um, Medvedev was magically re-replaced <laughs> as president by Vladimir Putin. Um, the other thing you can do if you have a simpler definition of democracy is you can see, well, okay, how do countries that have this set of rules differ in other ways that we might think of as being democratic? So are they more participative? I suppose there's a dilemma if you say, well, all of these things go together. You have to be participative and you have to be equal in your economy and society as well as politics. Then it's sort of hard to know what explains what, but that's my social scientist hat talking. So I suppose it's disappointing to people to say, yes, a that can be a democracy, but it does clarify what's not democratic. So Russia is not democratic for the reason that you can't lose an election there. The election doesn't matter. I, I, I think you are absolutely right about this. And, you know, we've only got to look much, much closer, not just closer to home, but at home. The Thatcher government... Uh, began in 1969, uh, 1979, and uh, went right through the 80s. And I, I spent a lot of time reporting on aspects of, of, of the Thatcher. And one of the things that really uh, drew my attention was the way in which uh, members of the Conservative Party and government ministers had the kind of feeling they were there for good. Mm -hmm. And... That led to, actually under Thatcher, it has to be said, li very limited degrees of corruption. And worse than corruption, people, uh, governments, uh, ministers doing things that they thought they could get away with because there was never going to be any retribution. Uh, we've just, uh, we're still seeing the, the, the outcome of what happened in Scotland, where we had a party which also thought it was there, it was there for good. Now, you know, by comparison with what's happening, say, in South Africa at the moment, when billions, um, tens of billions of money was uh, were taken out of of the economy and parked. Uh, in in Dubai and 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 other places, uh, you know what's happening in in Scotland is really really minor, but it leads to that sense that you know you don't need to worry too much about the exact kind of details of the law. You you know you feel you're doing the right thing. You feel you're doing it in everybody's interest, and you know you just can. Write write a check for something or buy a buy a, um, a, a Winnebago and forget to tell everybody else what you're doing. You know you're okay. The thing, exactly as you say, Ben, if you if you can hear the clock ticking, the electoral clock ticking all the time, and you know that within four years in the American system, five years in ours, um, five years in France that you're likely, or at least possibly, going to be out, then you're much, much more careful. And it's that sense of rot rotation in office, which I feel is actually one of the central elements of a, of a free society. So is that sufficient for the audience? I'd like to bring in questions about um, this notion of democracy. We've had a robust defense of the occasional opportunity uh, to throw the rascals out is sufficient as a, as a definition of democracy. 
Are we satisfied in the room or do people want to raise challenges or bring different views? Yes, sir. The but doesn't that lead to short term debt? Oh, absolutely. That's but I'd I'd wonder where there isn't short term thinking. I mean, you might say uh, China is long term thinking. Actually, so many of the policies of the CCP are, are really quite quite short, as we saw over COVID, for instance. And um, but I, of course you're of course you're right. But short termism is not only the political state of mind, it's the human state of mind. I mean, you know, I can't imagine what things are gonna be like in six months time. Well, Ben, you've thought about short termism, tell us more. So the problem with writing a book where there is five different areas and you find solutions for one is you, you just end up kind of pulling, pulling the tablecloth out from trying to keep all the dishes still on the table for all the others. And I think it's tricky in this case. So the prosperity trap at the end of the book is more about economic growth. And there, the problem is that what's good for us in the short run often undermines our, our long-run goals, right? So there are these short-term temptations that may well come from office, particularly if, you, uh, and this I think is actually a problem with term limits. If you know you've got to go and you can't be re-elected, well, then that does re lead to extremely short-term behavior. And this is one of the problems with the US debate about, about term limits. Um, so that might make you think, well, okay, if you can plan for the long run, then you are likely to get better growth and investment. And I think one could make arguments about Singaporean growth uh, that look much like that. But Singapore has still ended up as a one-party state with endemic corruption in that party uh, and with a whole bunch of rights that you and I cherish not granted to its citizens. So the challenge for all of us, and this is why politics is difficult, right? And, and, and again, there's no third party that can enforce any of this stuff. So we have to make decisions ourselves. We, we have to find political systems that can allow the rotation, but keep some stability. Our civil service does that to some degree, although it also goes off piste and does its own thing. I talk a little bit about the merits that I think do hold to some degree of proportional representation systems where there's less shifting in policy, but that's the reason there's less shifting in policy in those countries and it's more stable is because the same damn parties are always in office, right? Uh, you know, Mark Rutte, I talk about him as prime minister of the Netherlands, having coalitions with every single other major Dutch political party over 10 years. So if the problem is Mark Rutte, that doesn't help, but if it's, if it's not, and if he's able to think for the long run, well, then you do get the benefit of rotation, but long run. Which, which, we, which we have trouble with in this country, I think. Yes, sir, in the back. I agree with you, I wonder if you work for, say, a foreign office and you want an early warning system to spot countries that might backslide and revert to authoritarianism, wouldn't we perhaps be better off as policymakers to look at these more substantive measures like Freedom House? So is there a trade-off between on the one hand, social scientists should probably operate with a minimalist definition, whereas policymakers are better off using a more substantive um, conceptualization of democracy. So that's, I, I actually used to ask my Blavatnik students to do a um, to do a little kind of um, uh, a little essay on that. Uh, every, you know, you're working for the World Bank and you have to come up with an index to say these countries meet this criteria on good governance and those that don't, uh, precisely because it's it's not easy. Um, part of the problem that social scientists have faced with using Freedom House or using even now this new varieties of democracy index is those indices rely on the judgments of other social scientists. Uh, the problem that we saw in, in 2017 was a lot of those indices made both the United Kingdom and the United States less democratic. In fact, the US became less democratic than it had been since 1845, which doesn't, I mean, look, I'm not a huge fan of Donald Trump, but it doesn't feel to me that America became sort of literally antediluvian, <laughs> well, anti, anti bellum, I should say. I don't know when the flood happened. Um, so that is a challenge there, I think. So we, we all want to find more variability and, and have early warning signals. But unless there's a transparent thing that we all agree that we're measuring, then the danger is that we rely on what some academic who we haven't spoken to says or or worse, what somebody in that country who somehow gets to help code that country says. I think that's an unavoidable challenge. I think it's one that students at BSG need to think really hard about. Uh, ultimately, it's a trade-off in, in informational terms. So um, we have a question online from Elena uh, Dinishkina, excuse me for pronunciation, um, 
about the technological elements of democracy, um, or in particular, can e-governance be seen as e-democracy or digital tailorism? Oh, that's a great that's a great phrasing. Um, so, I do want to say a word about what digital tailorism might be. Well, so, so, tailorism meaning meaning like Ford and the design of factories yeah, exactly. making us. I'm, I'm not actually sure what we're all doing. <laughs> Is are we all, are we all voting all the time to make democracy happen in a kind of I guess horrible all, yeah. proletarian way? Um, Here's, here's what I'll say about some ways that technology helps. Um, John, you'll be delighted to know that I mentioned Taiwan very briefly in the book, but it's about yeah. virtual so, democracy in Taiwan. You'll find, I mean, there was a lot going on in this book. They have a system where it's a bit like Reddit, where, where you can uh, put in policy ideas that they, they use, for example, should we allow Uber in various cities or should we allow people to buy alcohol online? I know this like, seems like really small ball stuff, but I guess this is actually stuff people care about as well. Uh, and they are, and you could essentially write a comment, write a policy type, and then people couldn't reply to it. They could only upload it or downvote it. And if they didn't like it, they had to replace it with their own comment. So this was a way to sort of get back and forth, but without polarizing people. Uh, and that was a neat initiative. So I think that works really well. I'm more concerned about, um, and this is, is a bit more tailor right? artificial intelligence-based voting, which DeepMind and others have spoken about recently. So any of you who've done those polls online, where you answer a bunch of questions and then it places who you should vote for or where you are in a political compass. Uh, most AI models are just really advanced versions of that. They're just classification models that are trying to put you in places. So you could answer a bunch of questions every now and then, and then your computer could figure out from that, okay, well, now this set of questions have come up and I know where this person is in nine different dimensions. So they'll like this and they won't like that. And they could essentially vote for you. And a lot of people have been discussing the idea of these AI avatars. But I mean, I mean, I don't maybe need to say but because you're probably all thinking that's horrible. But if you're not thinking it's horrible, there are some risks to this because, okay, do we outsource the voting? Do our AI avatars vote against one another? And there are some core problems with democratic decision making that I talk about in the book, this is the famous arrows and possibility theorem, that there are some voting principles, some sets of preferences we have that you simply can't add up together to an answer. And you can't make that work with a microprocessor any more than we can make it work with a human brain. So we could just end up with sort of computers horse trading with one another, but not at the speed of politicians, at the speed of microprocessors. Um, so that's what I mean, that you can't use technology to take politics away. There are some fundamental differences we have. We can't outsource to computers. Can I just say that it, it seems to me that the most important element in a, in a democracy is not necessarily um, being able to vote, although, I mean, impossible to think of a democracy where you, you couldn't vote. But it's, I think most people would feel that the, the key thing is the the right to be able to speak their minds, do these, fill in these kind of things, like in Taiwan, I, I didn't know about that, but the sense that your voice um, may not be the dominant voice, may not uh, really um, uh, have much attention paid to it, but that you can talk to other people openly, either online or, 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 or publicly, and say what kind of of system you want and what kind of small time stuff uh, like 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 uh, as you say well like in in Oxford you know we have this sense that these uh, whatever it's called low density areas are being absolutely imposed on us. I mean I don't care uh, terribly much, but I know an awful lot of people who do care, and you know I don't remember that voting for it, but I do remember being able, if I wanted to, to, to turn up at meetings and make a noise about it. And that, that seems to me the even more essential than once every four or five years putting a, putting a, a tick in a box. Yeah, I mean, low traffic, maybe you should, any of you who want to understand how the democracy, democratic debate functions in a community should go to the Oxford Next Door page and look at the debates about the low traffic neighborhoods, because they are fascinating. And people either feel there wasn't enough consultation or that there was too much consultation, but actually there's democracy still a lot going on on next door. 
It's people disagreeing with one another and coming to decisions. And um, in the end, low traffic neighborhoods made a very short appearance in passing in this book. But uh, I gave the book to a journalist who lives in Oxford. And he's like, this book is really, it just helps me understand low, the low traffic neighborhood <laughs> debate. And I thought, okay, that's because that's a classic political problem um, that doesn't have an easy answer where each of us has individual incentives that ends up either slowing down traffic or creating pollution elsewhere or speeding up traffic in ways that affect other people. That's political life. And it's very hard to monitor. That's why people are able to vandalize bollards yeah. so effectively. But well, it, it's, sorry, go it's, ahead. It's, it's this binary problem, isn't it? You, you either have them or you right. don't have them. You're either, uh, uh, your country is either in the European Union or it's out of the European Union. Uh, Questions of roughly similar gravity. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> um, in Scotland, you're, you're either independent or you're part of the United Kingdom. And I can't think of anything in my lifetime uh, in this country that's been more divisive than those two years, 2014 and, and uh, uh, 2016, when um, we voted on these things. And the, the divisions that were created then are still just as strongly with us today and the, the bitterness, the nastiness that got introduced, the, all the business of the populism, corruption, all due, I think, I would say, to saying to everybody, okay, you're in a democratic society, we'd like to hear your voice on this one thing, but you've got to choose one of two options. And that doesn't seem to me to have served the the interests of democracy, it served other interests altogether. So it, it manufactures a will of the people, but it's always going to be a will of a majority. And then you have the problem of losers' consent in both ways. The losers have to consent that the winners won, and that was a problem. And then the winners have to accept that there were losers who they can't just trample on. That was also a problem. And so we've ended up polarized, on top of which it turns out that doing Brexit is not binary, but voting for Brexit is binary. And that's been very, very difficult as well. So I want to pivot us for, from the, the question of democracy to the question of solidarity, Ben, because um, you say a lot in your chapter about the problems of division, uh, including racial division, and how it keeps solidarity from happening. Talk about the traps of, uh, uh, of solidarity that you see happening, particularly through race. And um, in a multiracial society like the United Kingdom, uh, is there a solidaristic way out? Or are we doomed to leveling down, not leveling up because we can't all be see ourselves as one? So we're never doomed to that because there's a third chapter in each section that provides solutions. No, I got the structure after a little while. Yeah. <laughs> um, so social scientists who study um, the welfare state, so all the forms of social spending, that's the sort of code word that we use this, have for the last three or four decades been wrestling with this set of correlations that keeps appearing, which is that more diverse societies tend to have smaller welfare states, tend to have lower levels of public spending. And then the uh, deduction from that, which, which may be false, but it seems to come up again and again, is that's something to do with a distaste for diversity. It's something to do with ethnocentrism, people not wanting to spend money on people who don't look like them, and people wanting to spend money on people who do look like them. So they find for American um, scholars of, of American behavioral politics find that people who respond more strongly on these ethnocentric indices they come up with, which are basically like ranking your ethnic group versus others, which is kind of a weird thing to do in a survey. But they, whites who are ethnocentric in America are less supportive of what they call welfare, which is basically um, sort of cash payments to poor people that they think go to black citizens, but they are more supportive than other whites are of social security, the old age pension system that they think goes to old white people, right? So it, it cuts both ways. Um, some people have argued that this is a challenge for Scandinavian countries, right, which have large welfare systems and also did not have much um, ethnic heterogeneity, ethnic diversity until the last decade. Um, so, look, I think it's true. There are racists out there. I think it's quite hard to make it through uh, the last five or six years without, without realizing that or going on the, going in the comments sections of newspapers. Um, but I don't think we're doomed. Um, 
But what I do think is that people are attracted to group identities and others. And the way that we've, and othering people, and the way we handled this in the past was othering the Soviet Union or othering Nazi Germany. Uh, the welfare state got built in the UK and in the US during periods of great social turmoil, but also during periods of warfare where there was a clear opponent, right? So in that way, it was easier to bind the nation together. Uh, and if we think about, I suppose, successful, if, if we're not going to have a war, because that doesn't, well, although we do in fact have a war, uh, but if we're not going to use war as a way of buttressing the welfare state, which seems seems maybe um, an extreme way of getting there, the, the way that the, the Scots have handled this, maybe, it, it, I mean, I find it kind of interesting, the SNP, right? So how well have they governed Scotland? Who knows? Have they been effective at turning what was initially, I think, a kind of centre-right party into this centre-left recreation of the Labour Party in Scotland with high public spending? They have. And essentially, they created this kind of civic national idea, where the other was England. I, I mean, I assume it wasn't really Wales. Uh, and they have kind of bound Scots together in a solidaristic way that I think has made it easier to tax Scots more for their own healthcare service and things like that. Right? So you could argue that finding another or wrapping yourself in the flag, I, I use this example from an interesting academic paper, an experimental paper, where they asked Hindus in India whether they wanted to give money to a village that had a catastrophe, uh, a Muslim village. And uh, they either showed a map with the Indian flag on it at the top of the screen, or they didn't. And if they had the map, it massively increased the level that Hindus wanted to give to Muslims. Right? So that's, that's you know, quite literally wrapping the welfare state in a flag, but it's effective. But it's effective in a kind of nationalistic way that might make us concerned. But I think ultimately, all of us, we have limits to our solidarity, even if we might claim we're true cosmopolitans. Most people do believe charity begins at home. And so you have to define what that home looks like. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dave. I'm just interested in this idea of civic nationalism versus ethnic nationalism. Um, some scholars argue that civic nationalism is not a sufficiently thick basis to mobilize uh, collective action. I'm just wondering whether you think that's the case and whether um, and how you would construct a, a civic nationalism. And my second question, which is related, is you know, do you think there's an inevitability that civic nationalism, if it isn't sufficiently thick, becomes ethnic nationalism. So I think that the Scottish National Party, for all of their faults, um, have pivoted to becoming, to essentially replacing Labour. Uh, and civic nationalism worked in that binding way to the point where Hamza Youssef is now the leader of the party as well. So I don't think it has become ethnic nationalism for them. However, I also think we're at a pivot point for the Scottish National Party. And I'm concerned that that branch of civic nationalism is going to weaken under a resurgent Labour Party on the one hand, and the possibility that there are still ethnic differences in Scotland. Scotland is not magically immune from racism and ethnic differences. Uh, and independence as a binding force uh, might have reduced those differences. Um, but the failure of independence might be a solvent and, you know, sort of debind those differences. Um, so we'll, we'll find out in that case. I, I think the jury is out on civic nationalism because it's a relatively new idea and the Catalans and the Scots are kind of the big proponents of it. And both of those are very politically um, tendentious situations. Can I uh, just propose something slightly different? The, the least successful states that I can think of really are um, Iraq now, uh, although actually Iraq, uh, a country I really love, is starting to climb out of the absolute pit of despair that, that followed the invasion in 2003. But Iraq, on the one hand, um, uh, uh, Syria, um, and, and the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, those are countries where there are really, really deep ethnic and and religious, not in the Congo religious, but 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 ethnic divides where you get angry groups of you know mutually hating people, which uh, makes it really really hard to construct a, a government. Lebanon, although milder in all those terms, is is another example. Um, 
And, you know, we need to think of ways in which that those divisions can be overcome. And India is a country which I think managed for decades to do that. I mean, more divided, uh, if anything, in religious and, and ethnic terms, and yet was successful because of the overarching Indian flag and the sense of, of Indian identity. And bingo, what do we get? A prime minister who wants to pull it all apart in the interests of one group. Now, I mean, as somebody that knows and loves India very much, I really, really, really hope he fails uh, because that is no way for a country to go. And, um, you know, I, I'm really, really upset to see somewhere that I was always uh, able to point to as an example of, 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 of good uh, um, uh, behavior now, taking a turn wrongly. But, you know, it is, it is possible to overcome those things, but I think you need a fairly sophisticated political elite um, and, uh, an, uh, and, and a, a sense of um, a, a democratic kind of duty, which India uh, has, I think still has, and has always had, to be able to, to, to overcome the, the Syrian and Iraqi and and uh, and Lebanese example. So Ben, turning to the cases that uh, that John just raised, Iraq, Syria, the Democratic Republic of Congo, these are places that uh, face the security dilemma that you talk about big time between uh, anarchy and tyranny. Uh, where would you advise them to land? Um, none of those countries are effective tyrannies, I suppose, in to the be sense. Sure. Although. And Iraq, of course, was an effective tyranny under Saddam Hussein. Um, so in the security chapter, I talk essentially that one can't avoid anarchy without risking tyranny. Um, there is an inertia when you move away from an anarchic society to try and contain security problems and, and the lack of safety that we see in, in Sudan, for example, right? Uh, because any force that's powerful enough to contain that anarchy is also powerful enough not only to protect people, to, but to predate on people. Uh, and ultimately, that's why one can sort of slip in both directions. And the history of, of Somalia looks like that. Um, Siad Barre, it's a, it's a tyranny, and then afterwards, it's a, it's a complete anarchy. Um, those are challenges that that this country went through in the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, right? We moved from the chaos of the, 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 the anarchy uh, through the War of the Roses and then into Tudor tyranny and then into the Civil War and then into Cromwell's tyranny and back and forth. And each swing has been maybe less volatile, right? The pendulum has slowed. Uh, I think it's, there is no quick fix, in other words. Uh, and one... You could have looked at Lebanon and thought, actually, the pendulum is slowing, but unfortunately, it's sped up again over the last 10 or 15 years. That, I think, is a challenge that in my book alone can't answer. Um, sometimes failure happens in so many domains that it's that it's almost impossible but to claw it's out. It's been economic failure in Lebanon that's, right, that's exactly. really caused all that. I mean, the, you know, the, the huge corruption, but also the... The, the disaster, the bomb disaster, the um, explosion. Yeah, the explosion of the fertilizer, yeah. yeah. yeah in, in other words, in order to have security, you probably need prosperity. Yeah. But in order to have prosperity, you need to be able to plan for the long run. The um, political economist Mansa Olson famously spoke about moving from roving bandits to a stationary bandit, yeah. right? A leader who would, like, who would predate on you, they had to keep you alive in order to predate on you. So that was better than not being kept alive. The trouble is with some of those people, I mean, like Saddam Hussein um, in Iraq, that the only way he felt that he could keep power over his restless lieutenants was to go and invade somewhere else, like Kuwait. Um, and and that, that, of course, brought about more worse things and his own eventual downfall. We have landed in a dire place, and politics sometimes does. Um, but Ben's book will help you understand better, I think, uh, why it does, and occasionally why we can get out of this. John, thank you for helping me discuss this. And Ben, thank you for bringing this to us so we better understand the problems of politics in the modern age. Thank you.
Thank you all very much. Thank you.